All right, now let's get into the grouping of the amino acids. And this grouping is somewhat arbitrary. You can see it a little bit differently in uh, various textbooks and PowerPoint presentations, but this is the group that we're, we're grouping that we're going to use. These are what we call the nonpolar aliphatic R groups. What that means is that in general, they are just simple non-aromatic carbon chains. And they can have other atoms there. Um, for example, methionine has a sulfur right here, and glycine only has a hydrogen. But the point is, is they're nonpolar. They are not polar groups. Okay, so we have glycine, alanine, proline, valine, leucine, isoleucine, and methionine. Now, out of this group of amino acids, it turns out that glycine and alanine are very important for energy production. Uh, that's because in order to degrade them, their metabolic pathways are actually very simple. So it turns out that these two amino acids are used a lot for energy production. Now, in terms of specific functions, first of all, we've mentioned that glycine is achiral. And as we'll talk about in the protein structure lecture, glycine is an important amino acid found in beta terms in proteins. Um, we'll talk more about that later. Also, glycine is an important central nervous system inhibitory neurotransmitter. Proline is the only cyclic amino acid. Now, if you go to one of the next slides, you'll notice that well, these are cycles right here. That's not what I mean. If you notice, the nitrogen of the alpha amine actually through this carbon chain connects back to the alpha carbon. Okay, we don't find that in any of the other amino acids. For example, notice this alpha amine does not connect back through any uh, carbon chain back to the alpha carbon. Okay, they're free amines like, like this. So proline is the only cyclic amino acid in that sense. Also, proline is found in beta terms, very similarly to glycine. And also we find proline as a major constituent of collagen. That is the hydroxylated version of proline. Okay, methionine, MET, can be transformed into a molecule called s methionine, which we'll call SAM, and this is important for methylation reactions. Okay, so methylation reactions are important for simple just transformations. We, we see it in, say, epinephrine synthesis, but we also see methylation as an important part in the regulation of gene expression. And then we have three amino acids, valine, isoleucine, and leucine, which are gonna be referred to as branch chain amino acids. And these are gonna be, as we'll see in the next slide, a very important source of energy for skeletal muscle. Now, for branch chain amino acids, we typically abbreviate this, abbreviate this BCAAs. And if you go to a drugstore, you'll often see supplements called BCAAs. That stands for branch chain amino acids. And the three branch chain amino acids are valine, leucine, and isoleucine. The reason they're called this is if you look at their R groups, they at some point have a branched carbon chain. So here's the branched carbon right there. In isoleucine, here's the branched carbon. And in valine, here's the branched carbon. Thus, they're BCAAs. The BCAAs are essential amino acids. And we'll talk more about distinguishing essential versus non-essential later. But suffice it to say right now, essential amino acids cannot be synthesized by humans. They have to be obtained through the diet. And all three of these BCAAs are essential. Now what's notable about BCAAs is that they are a major metabolic source of energy in skeletal muscle and not the liver. All other 17 amino acids that we're going to see here are degraded mostly in the liver. Um, there are other cells that can degrade them throughout the body, but in general the liver is the major uh, workhorse for degradation of amino acids for energy. It turns out that BCAAs are really not degraded in the liver so much. They're actually degraded in skeletal muscle. And one other function of these that I'm going to mention is that leucine, isoleucine, and valine, but especially leucine, strongly stimulate protein synthesis, which is going to be important if we're talking about resistance training. So if you go to the gym and you lift weights, it turns out that Leucine in particular, but all of the BCAAs strongly stimulate muscle protein synthesis directly after a bout of resistance training. Okay? Now, the next group of amino acids is the aromatic amino acids, and there's three of these. Phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. 
The aromatic amino acids all have, at least in some way, this characteristic benzene ring. It's a six carbon ring with three double bonds conjugated around it. Tryptophan is a little different because, first of all, it's not just a simple benzene, it's an indole, so it's our group is called an indole ring with this other five-membered ring with a nitrogen. And then tyrosines has a hydroxyl group across the ring or para from the rest of the amino acid. Okay. Now, the aromatic amino acids have some other very unique functions. First of all, phenylalanine is a component of aspartame. So if you've ever consumed a Diet Coke, uh, Diet Coke and a lot of the diet sodas contain an ingredient known as aspartame, which is an artificial sweetener. Aspartame is a dipeptide of aspartate and phenylalanine. And we'll look at it a little bit later, but suffice it to say, whenever you see on the can phenylketonurics, beware, Phenylketonurics have a disease called phenylketonuria, and we'll go into more of that again a lot later in this course, but suffice it to say phenylketonuria is a disease of a deficiency of an enzyme that degrades phenylalanine. So if they can't degrade phenylalanine, then levels of phenylalanine build up and cause all sorts of problems. And so for that reason, the law requires that anything that contains aspartame to say that warning phenylketonurics beware, because aspartame degrades into phenylalanine. Okay? Also, phenylalanine is a precursor to tyrosine. Now, tyrosine has a very important function. It's a precursor to catecholamines. Catecholamines are neurotransmitters or hormones such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, and they play a lot of roles that we'll talk about a lot later. Additionally, tyrosine can be processed into melanin, which is the component of skin that gives it a darker color. The more melanin that you have in your skin, um, the darker your skin is. Okay? Tryptophan is a precursor of serotonin and melatonin. Okay? So a lot of these amino acids are precursors to other things, particularly tyrosine and tryptophan. Now what's really important is that all of these amino acids, in particular tyrosine and tryptophan, but um, usually most derivatives of these amino acids, absorb light, particularly in the UV or ultraviolet region of the spectrum. And that can play a major role in some of their functions. For example, we said tyrosine was metabolized or polymerized into melanin which is that component of skin that gives uh, skin a darker color. Well, the more melanin you have, the more resistant you are to damage from UV light from the sun. And part of that resistance to UV light damage is melanin's ability to absorb light from the sun and dissipate it as heat. Okay? And this is just a graph showing the relative absorbance of each of the amino acids. As you, as you can see, tryptophan absorbs the most, followed by tyrosine, then phenylalanine has some weak absorbance of light. All right, all of those amino acids that we looked at thus far were nonpolar amino acids. Now we're going to look at the polar amino acids. These ones that are polar and uncharged are serine, threonine, cysteine, asparagine, and glutamine. Now, all of these are important, obviously, but two of them are very important for things we're going to talk about a lot. For example, cysteine can form disulfide bridges and is redox active, okay? Meaning, um, cysteine can be act as an antioxidant, but also cysteine, as shown in this picture right here, cysteine is part of two proteins or two different regions of one protein, can be oxidized into a disulfide bridge. So you've probably heard of disulfide bridges, whether it's in an a &P class or a physiology course. This is literally what's happening. The cysteine R groups become oxidized, they get their hydrogens pulled off, and the two sulfurs of the individual cysteines form a bond, and that's the disulfide bridge. And it plays a role in tertiary structures of proteins and linking two proteins together or two regions of one protein together. Another important amino acid is glutamine. Glutamine is a nitrogen transporter. You see glutamine right here. It has this amide functional group that carries this nitrogen. Um, that nitrogen can come from ammonia, which is toxic to the body. And so glutamine can be a transient carrier of that ammonia, okay, which is important. Also, glutamine, as we'll see much later in metabolic pathways, glutamine can be a large source of energy for the Krebs cycle. 
Additionally, asparagine can also, because asparagine can be degraded ultimately to aspartate and then to oxaloacetate, which is another Krebs cycle intermediate. But don't worry about that right now. We're just going to focus on the major functions. Just understand that asparagine and glutamine can both be metabolized for energy to a pretty large extent. All right, so these are more polar amino acids, but these are different than the last group because this group is charged. These ones are specifically positively charged, and these three are lysine, arginine, and histidine. So first of all, lysine. What does lysine do? Well, lysine, notice, has this long carbon chain arm that terminates in an amine. Well, it turns out that that amine at the tail of lysine can actually be conjugated to different coenzymes. Two coenzymes that we're going to talk about in particular are biotin and pyridoxal phosphate. We have not talked about those yet, but in a very soon upcoming lecture we will. Lysine, as part of an enzyme, can be conjugated to those, and then those coenzymes can perform various metabolic functions. Arginine, shown right here, is going to be a precursor to nitric oxide and creatine. Nitric oxide is a very important vasodilator that plays a role in exercise, but also um, immunological reactions. And then creatine is important for skeletal muscle metabolism. In fact, creatine is very important for extremely high intensity exercises. Okay, so things like powerlifting and sprinting. And then the last one, histidine, so his, histidine is a major component of buffers, particularly in the plasma, but then also inside the cell. So for example, there are histidine residues. Residue is a term for an amino acid that's part of a protein. So if we're talking about one amino acid, we'll often say this particular residue. We'll talk about that later. But histidines that are part of hemoglobin, the protein in the blood, can actually act as a buffer in the blood. Additionally, there are histidines inside the cell that can also buffer inside the cell. Okay? Also, histidine is a precursor to histamine, which in the brain acts as a neurotransmitter to promote wakefulness. But also in terms of the immune system, histamine promotes inflammation and increased vascular permeability. So you can see there's a lot of functions of these amino acids. Now, these two amino acids are negatively charged amino acids, okay, so polar and negatively charged. These are aspartate and glutamate, all right. By far the most important one of these is glutamate. They're both metabolized for energy, as I mentioned before, but glutamate not only is a huge source of energy for the Krebs cycle, glutamate itself is also a central nervous system neurotransmitter. It's the excitatory one. You might remember from anatomy and physiology that GABA is the central nervous system inhibitory neurotransmitter. It turns out that glutamate is a direct precursor for GABA. So not only does glutamate itself act as an excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, but it can be processed in one enzymatic step into GABA, the central nervous system inhibitory neurotransmitter. And we're going to talk about that much later when we start discussing more metabolic pathways. All right, so thank you for watching this video. Uh, make sure to like it and subscribe. In the next video, we're going to go over more of amino acid and then protein structure. Thank you for watching this video.